All right, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Has everybody had their coffee yet? Coffee? Coffee? Okay, I've had my coffee. Uh, we're going to be talking numbers, stats. So if you haven't had your coffee, you might want to go get some first. <laughs> uh, how many of you have podcasts other than... Okay. And how often after you post an episode do you check your stats? We're afraid to look. You're afraid to look? <laughs> we don't want to know. <laughs> we often uh, coin the term Statsaholics Anonymous because there are producers out there who will literally publish an episode and every five minutes they're refreshing the stats screen. Did I get another download? Did I get another download? So we're going to talk about numbers and we're going to talk about what those numbers actually mean. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Crystal O'Connor. I currently work for Lipson, based out of our hometown of Pittsburgh. I've been in the tech industry for about 15 years. I've been at this for a little while. And for those of you who also have blogs or websites, one of the things you're going to find as we go through some of these definitions and some of these numbers is there are some parallels between web stats and podcasting stats, but there's also an awful lot of differences. So we're going to actually start off with some definitions. Wow, that text really whited out, didn't it? Yikes. OK. We're going to start with some definitions. We're going to talk about what some of these terms are before we move on, just to get that cleared out of the way. Hopefully you can, yes, good. Black is good. Uh, so we're going to talk about streams. A stream is where the media file is actually being played from the server it's hosted on. So think YouTube. You know, you go to youtube.com and you find a video and you hit the play button. When you hit the play button, that video is not being played from your local computer. It's being played from the server out there somewhere. That is a stream. As opposed to a download. A download is when you literally and physically download the media file to your local computer. So it can be played for offline listening. You can be online or offline, it doesn't matter, but the file is being played offline on your local device, not on the server out there. That is a download. Then we get to progressive downloads. And this is where Oftentimes, people confuse a download with a stream. In podcasting, most listens are actually occurring through what is called a progressive download when played through a media player. And what that means is when someone hits your website and they hit play on that HTML5 media player that has your audio podcast in it, it's actually buffering that file to a temporary location on the listener's computer and playing from the listener's computer. It's not streaming from the server. It's playing from your local computer through a player in a browser. This is why it matters. Common questions. Why can't I see any listen stats? I only see downloads. Where are all the stats for my streams? What if someone plays my content using an embedded player on my site? When you're talking about podcasting stats, everything is a download. Everything is a download, because it's either happening as a download or it's happening as a progressive download. Either way, the file is being played off the local computer and not the server out there like it does on YouTube. So when you look at your podcasting stats, it's going to appear as a download. And that's because even if it's played in a media player off your website, it is technically still a download. So we're going to take a look at some numbers and what some of these numbers mean. We're going to start with general download numbers. Uh, whenever you post an episode and someone downloads it using iTunes or Pocket Casts or Overcast, BeyondPod, or hits that play button in the HTML5 media player on your website, that is included as a download. So when you look at your stats, now these are Lipson stats, 
But when you look at your stats, you're gonna see general numbers for how many times your show overall or how many times your episode overall has actually been downloaded by an end listener. You can break that down into downloads by day. So how many times a download occurred in a 24 hour period in a day. And in the Lipson system, if you click on one of these end nodes for your show, you'll actually get a breakdown as to which episodes were downloaded on that day. So typically what you see is if you publish an episode on say Sunday night, and you come in Monday afternoon and take a look at your stats, you're gonna see something like this, where the graph is gonna go up, and then after a day or two, maybe a few days, it's gonna come on back down, because most people's podcatchers are gonna refresh and download that episode so that they can listen to it later. So you're going to see spikes and downfalls, peaks and valleys throughout. These are going to be your release days. And if you were to look at how many downloads occur on a specific day, it's probably going to be that the episode released most recently has the most amount of downloads on that day. We can break, that con that we can break those numbers down even further by geographic stats. Uh, geographic information is actually provided by the network the end listener is coming from. So they tell us through technical stuff what area they are coming from and we parse that information and make that available. So you can see what countries those downloads are coming from. Uh, you can also break that down into regions and markets. In the United States, a region is gonna be a state, Pennsylvania, the state of New York, the state of Washington, the state of California, those are gonna be your regions. And then we have markets, which are typically in the United States going to be a city, um, like New York City or San Francisco, Los Angeles. Those are all going to be uh, your markets. My particular favorite breakdown is the breakdown of user agents. If you're looking in your lips and dashboard, this is going to be under the tab called technology. A user agent, simply put, is a program or an application used to download the media. So for example, the desktop application iTunes is a user agent. The download application Pocket Casts is a user agent. Stitcher for iOS is a user agent. If you ever look at your website stats, you probably will look and see in Google Analytics an option for browsers, and it'll say Chrome, Firefox, Mozilla, Internet Explorer, Edge. Browsers individually are also all user agents. So when we look at our user agents, we're looking at what applications are being used to download our content. Now, when it comes to podcasts, the majority, the large majority of your downloads are gonna come from iTunes, and they're gonna come from mobile applications, primarily the iOS Podcasts app and mobile Safari. So your top user agent is almost certainly and really should be Apple Core Media. So what is Apple Core Media? Apple Core Media is a generic user agent from Apple that is for mobile Safari and the iOS Podcasts app. So you're gonna see Apple Core Media and you're going to see iTunes. Those are most likely going to be the top two user agents for every single one of you out there. You're also going to see other user agents that are popular like Overcast, Pocket Casts, um, you'll see Stitcher Bot. If you submit your show to Stitcher, you will have at least one download listed for Stitcher Bot. Stitcher Bot isn't a listen, it's actually a bot that is used to pull in your content into the Stitcher system. So if you submit to Stitcher, you will see at least one download from Stitcher Bot. Then you'll start to get into other things like Stitcher iOS, NS Player, a couple of your browsers. And then, what the, 
is that? Some user agents are really funny looking. <laughs> Um, and when you look at them, they aren't necessarily obvious as to where they come from. My recommendation is copy the user agent out of your table verbatim and paste a query into Google. User agent paste and hit enter and scroll through. And you're going to start to see what that user agent might actually apply to. A user agent is actually set by whoever develops the program used to access your content. So you might have a developer out there that sets a user agent of Pocket Cast. Well, that would be for the app Pocket Cast. The developer actually set that. So whatever the developer is setting is what's going to be used. If they don't set it, it's going to be a default. So sometimes it looks funky. It really is going to be a what the bleep is that? copy and paste it into a Google query. If you email me and ask me what the user agent is, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna copy and paste it into a Google query. Now there's also social stats to look at, and these are actually social stats specifically with regards to the content that you post to social based on your podcast. So in these cases, these are posts that were created by Lipson on your behalf on your social network. We have destinations called on publish, so you can set up Facebook or Twitter to go out automatically. So these are posts actually created by Lipson. Since we created that post, we can actually track how many likes on Facebook, how many shares on Facebook, how many retweets on Twitter. So if you create an episode using Lipson and you have us automatically create that Facebook post or that Twitter post, we can actually generate stats based on that. So you can see, oh, look, I've had three shares on that post, which was created by Lipson. So that's at least three people, probably more, as a share who actually saw that episode. And just maybe they hit play. Destination stats is a brand new feature in Lipson. We announced this during podcast movement in July. That was in Chicago this year. And I kind of touched on this in the last slide, but Lipson operates off of destinations. And a destination is anywhere you can send your content to from our system. So your podcast RSS feed that we talked about in 101 yesterday, that is a destination. Your HTML5 media player that we create for you is a destination. Facebook is a destination. Anywhere you send your content to is a destination. So we can now break out downloads based on that destination. Just like with any other general number, we can break down for the RSS feed specifically how many downloads happen on a certain day. And we can break down exactly what user agents accessed only the RSS feed at a certain time. So it gets a lot more granular and really helps you determine where your audience is coming from, especially if you have a period where maybe you get featured or you're looking at your stats and you see an anomaly where you get tons more downloads than you've ever had before and you want to know where they're coming from. Being able to really dig into those numbers and see exactly where, exactly when, and from what can be really helpful in helping to track. Is that legitimate? Is that new audience? Is that a feature? Is that marketing campaign really working? Talked a lot about downloads. But don't get hung up on individual download counts. The end game is listeners. There's a difference between a listen and a listener. There's a difference between a download and a listener. The difference is a listen or a download is something or someone downloaded your file once and maybe listened to it. That's what we all hope, right? A listener is someone who hit the subscribe button and is constantly getting access to your content and is remaining engaged with your show. So over time, what you want to see isn't tons of downloads per episode on an individual episode basis. You want to see a growth trend line of overall listenership 
over time. An engaged audience of 300 listeners across the board is way more important than 1,000 downloads on that one episode. If you listen to, who out here other than you listens to uh, Rob and Elsie talk on the Feed podcast? Hands? Okay, okay. If you're not already listening, I don't know why you're not. You should be. But those of you who have listened have probably heard Rob Walsh carry on and on and on about Twitter bombers. Has anybody heard the term Twitter bomber other than you? Mackenzie's got it. <laughs> A Twitter bomber is someone who takes a URL, particularly to a download file, and they constantly post it on Twitter over and over and over again. Some people will actually create multiple Twitter accounts and post that URL literally every few minutes across multiple Twitter accounts. It's called Twitter bombing. People aren't gonna listen to an entire episode on Twitter. They might listen to two minutes, which is great because hopefully you're going to get them to engage with your show. But if you're posting it that many times and people click the link and then go away, you're gonna inflate your stats. It looks like, hey, I've got a thousand downloads on that episode, but how many people actually listened? If you look at your overall listenership over time, you get a much better idea of who your audience is and how often they're coming back. There are other ways to measure growth. Unfortunately, my pretty font colors aren't showing up here. Uh, Google Analytics, social engagement, surveys. And I think there was a session yesterday that dug into uh, Google Analytics. But when you're looking at website stats, it's, it's kind of similar to looking at podcast stats, right? We have overall visits or visitors as opposed to downloads. And we take a look at where they are coming from. Are they coming from a refer? Are they coming from search? Are they coming from social? We take a look at what social networks are coming from. Are they coming from Facebook? Are they coming from Twitter? Are they coming from Google Plus? That all gives us an idea of how our website for our show is growing. And then we take a look at Facebook and Twitter stats. How many posts did we make and how many people liked or shared that post? If we're running any ads, did anybody engage with that particular ad? Same thing over on Twitter. So why do we want to take a look at our Google Analytics and our Facebook and our Twitter in relationship to our podcast? That's because when you're looking at your podcast, that's one piece of an economic whole. It's one piece of the picture. You also have your blog page for your podcast, but you probably also have other blog posts on there. And you have people that come to your blog specifically for things like your show notes and your blog posts or people who go to Facebook because you probably don't just post your episodes on Facebook. You're probably resharing things and you're posting other articles and all kinds of other fun stuff. And on Twitter, you're probably having a back and forth conversation on specific topics in 140 characters or less. So they're all different things and they're all part of your overall community. So you're not just looking at podcast numbers, you're now looking at engagement across your entire ecosystem. And surveys, asking your audience. Um, one of the things that Lipson offers is a premium service called My Lipson. So you can put your content behind a subscription. So people would pay in order to access your content. And one of the questions that I get asked is, well, how do I know if my audience is actually going to pay for my content? And my answer is, ask them. Run a survey. Do a Facebook poll. Would you be interested in better content under a subscription if you were willing to pay for it. Run surveys, determine who your audience is, determine how engaged they are. Is everybody who listens to your show gonna fill out the survey? No, but if a third of them do, then you get some idea of who those people are, where they're coming from, and the fact that they filled it out means they're engaged with you as well. No, you can't do that. I will get support tickets from Lips and Folks who will say, I got 300 unique visitors on my blog page. Why don't I have 300 downloads to that podcast episode? That's because not everybody who hit your blog page actually hit the play button on your player or hit the download button to download your episode. 
There is no one-to-one -one relationship between how many Facebook likes that post got and how many times that play button was hit. There's no one-to-one -one relationship between how many visitors hit your blog and how many hit the play button. Of course, you hope every one of them do, but the reality is they're not going to. So why do it? Because now they've seen you. They know about you. Maybe they read about you and maybe later they're gonna go and convert as an iTunes subscriber. So it's about conversions. Don't create relationships in your numbers where relationships don't exist. So let's dispel some myths. There's a podcast resurgence. I heard this one yesterday. There's a, what about that podcast resurgence? We see all these articles about podcasts are growing at a hockey stick rate. Does everybody know what a hockey stick rate means? You know the shape of a hockey stick? We're in Pittsburgh, folks. You know the shape of a hockey stick? If you look at a graph, it goes like this, and then it goes whoop, like that. Ooh, that was a whoop. <laughs> that is hockey stick growth rate. Podcasting is back, because it totally didn't go away. <laughs> These are all myths. I'm going to thank Rob Walsh, our VP of Podcasting Relations, for some of the research that he did here. He went into the Lipson's network stats, all of our stats in our system, and came out with some of the numbers that we see. And as one of the largest podcast hosts, we happen to have pretty good insight on where numbers are coming from. So this is an adjusted mean average of downloads per episode. And you can see November of 2012, and we go up from there, how many downloads, this is an adjusted mean, are coming per episode. And they go up, and they go down, and they go up, and they go down, and they go up, and they go down. Does that line look like a hockey stick? I don't think it really looks like a hockey stick. I think it looks like if you put a trend line in here, it's just gonna go right across with a little bit of a consistent up. How podcasts are consumed. Psst, it's not the connected car. iTunes and podcast app. 58.26% of your downloads are coming from the iTunes and the iOS podcast app. Remember earlier when I mentioned when you look at your user agents, almost every single one of you, the highest user agents is going to be Apple Core Media and iTunes? That's why. If that isn't true for you, you're doing something wrong, come see me later. Mobile aggregator apps, Pocket Cast, Beyond Pod, all of those. Mobile aggregator apps. So if you add those together, that's an awful lot coming through mobile. How long have cars had Bluetooth? Bluetooth has been around for quite a while. So if you're using one of these aggregator apps and you connect your phone via Bluetooth, the connected car has been here for a while. Stitcher, 2.61%. They're hanging on. They're hanging on. OEM apps, that's going to be uh, Samsung, HTC, the player that they have built in to their device. Personal podcast app. Uh, Lipson will actually create an app custom for your show. It's custom branded, it's your app, iOS, Android, and Windows 8. That's what those are. Web browsers, 14.11%, and miscellaneous, all that other stuff, at 2.75%. So how do you stack up? How do you know if your show is being successful? Can't be getting nearly enough downloads. This is something I, I hear often. Oh, man got a hundred downloads on that episode. I must not be doing that well. And <laughs> funny, funny side bit, last night I was talking to my husband and I was running through the slides. I had it airplayed to my TV in the living room because I'm that much of a total nerd. And I start talking about how people get so hung up on how they only got a hundred downloads or 150 downloads on that episode. And I said, imagine if you filled, what if this room was filled with 150 people? my boots would probably be shaking a whole lot more. Uh, I can tell you that. And when you release an episode and you're getting 100, 150 downloads, well, that's a pretty big room full of people that are listening to you. And if they keep coming back, that's a pretty nice audience that you're talking to every single time you release an episode. 
And he said, are you sure about that? He works for a web hosting company, so he sees all of these web hosting numbers and how many visitors you get, and he was like, I'm just not sure about that. And I said, well, let me put you in a room full of 150 people and see how well you do when you talk. Oh, <laughs> well, okay. Download averages per episode across our entire network. The median is around 150 downloads per episode across our entire network. If you're getting around 500 downloads an episode, you're in the top 20% of all shows. If you're getting around 550,000 downloads an episode, your name must be Dan Carlin. That's the top 1%. So if you're getting 150, 200, 300 downloads an episode, you're doing something right. Keep doing it. You have a niche audience. And if you're thinking about sponsors, and you're thinking, well, at 150 or 200 downloads an episode, am I really going to be able to get a sponsor? If you have a niche topic, and you have a niche but highly engaged audience that keeps coming back, that's talking to you on Facebook and Twitter, that's on your newsletter, and you start counting all of those things together, and you go to a sponsor that is almost certainly gonna fit right into that niche, they're probably gonna see a higher ROI because your engaged audience is going to engage with that ad. So it all comes down to, well, how engaged is that audience? If that audience is engaged, you're good. What if I put those listeners into a room, 150 listeners? It's a great audience, engage with them. I'll be honest with you, when I first started podcasting, I kind of thought the same thing. You know, only 100 episodes of download, oh my God. Dave Jackson's the one who taught me this one. He's sitting right there, by the way. Any questions? Yes. Questions? Um, somehow SoundCloud is missing from the picture that you just presented. And I don't know, I do a lot of listening on SoundCloud just because it allows me to you know, look to see who else is listening to a given you know, bit of content. And find, it allows me to more easily find similar content and similar listeners and stuff like that and explore the universe a bit better. Um, and I was looking through um, podcasts, School of Podcasts, um, School of Podcasting, um, posts on SoundCloud and whether it's like a legitimate place to host your stuff, stuff like that. And it seems like those were about two years old. I wonder how that, how SoundCloud has changed in that time. Well, SoundCloud just went out for sale after getting an $80 million injection from Twitter, so yeah. that helps you out at all. Well, I know that <laughs> I know their future is tenuous, but... SoundCloud is not a podcast host. Yes. They technically they offer podcast hosting. Yes. Technically. But it's a place where people listen. It's really not. Uh, we can get stats for SoundCloud. If you have a podcast that you're pushing to SoundCloud, you can go to SoundCloud, you can get your numbers from there because we're not serving the content, they are. So you can go there and get stats. But overall, from what we have found, listeners are not pulling from SoundCloud. They're pulling from the iOS podcast app, they're pulling from mobile Safari, they're pulling from iTunes, and they're pulling from apps like BeyondPod, like uh, Pocket Cast, like Overcast. Um, that, that's, it's just, if you, it, yeah, the I folks who are getting 1,000, 2,000 downloads an episode and they're staring over on SoundCloud, they're lucky to get maybe 30 listens that are actually legitimate listens. So you're just not going to see the numbers over there. That is not me saying don't post there. Our system will automatically post to SoundCloud if you want, and that's fine. It doesn't hurt anything, but don't expect a high return. Right. I guess I just, I'm surprised that it's, more people don't listen there just because I find it really conducive to exploring the universe of audio production. Most of us are a little bit more technical just by the very fact that we're here. So one of the things that I always come back to is if I walk up to my mom and I say, hey, I've got this show, it's called The Drunken Tech, 
and you totally need to listen to this podcast, she's going to go, podcast? What the hell's a podcast? But if I tell her, hey, you have this app already installed on your phone, it's called Podcasts, and if you search for my name, and she knows my name, she named me, <laughs> she'll find me. Well, that's easy. But if I have to tell her, go download, go download SoundCloud, go create an account in SoundCloud through Facebook or Twitter or directly, and then go find me in this big sea of DJ music, that's just not gonna work for the average listener. Right. So, Again, I'm not saying there aren't people who use SoundCloud. I have a Pro Unlimited account. My past podcast was posted there. I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying don't expect a big return. The average listener is not going to use SoundCloud. Right, and they have their own way of calling stats. They do, yes. If you have an account with them, you can go in and look at your stats there. Right. We've considered trying through their API to pull stats, but they don't provide enough information and they don't provide it on a very timely manner. So for us to integrate it, it for the little amount of listens that are actually happening, it's, to be honest, not really worth the developer hours at this time. Mm -hmm. So one oh. follow-up question, you know, since you, you know, um, the various people in here know this industry relatively well in terms of the podcast world, mm -hmm. what do you think of SoundCloud's future? What do I personally think yeah. of SoundCloud's yeah. future? You know, they've tried to get licensing deals. Most of those have fallen through. They're really a social network for DJs and for indie music. Um, from a podcaster's perspective, I don't even think it's worth looking at. Yeah. I, I mean, yes, I've used it mostly because our producers do, so I like to do what our producers do so I know what they're doing and right. how that rate is, what, what's working, what isn't working. But if I were just out on my own, knowing the industry, I wouldn't even bother. Uh, he had his hand up first. Go ahead. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, what's the latest with Google Play Music? Obviously, they're recently launched. And yes. Android devices. Yes. Are you integrating into those? We do. We have a destination specific for Google Play Music. Uh, I have a tutorial over at support.lipson.com that will walk you through step by step how to set up that destination. Now, Google Play Music, with regards to stats, is not yet giving anybody their numbers. It's all in-house. You can go into their system and see the numbers. You can't pull those numbers. They hopefully will be releasing an API for that. Our developer team is ready to make that top priority the second that becomes available. It's not available yet. So with regards to stats, you have to go to them to see them. Um, but here's the thing about Google Play Music. Up until that was just released, there was no native app on Android devices for podcasts. Have you ever heard the death of the default? It's like why Internet Explorer was so popular because it was the default on PCs and Safari on Mac. It was the default on Mac, death of the default. It's why the iOS podcast app is so popular now because it's native on the device and we didn't have that for Google and we have that for Google now. So. I do highly recommend, whether you're hosting with Lipson or not, submitting to Google Play Music. It is still in beta, it's still slowly rolling. It's not on iOS devices yet, as he mentioned. It's on Android, it's on web browsers, um, but it's coming, it's moving, um, and they are really trying to integrate with the community. So I do recommend submitting so that you're there and ready when it goes full blown. There were some other hands, yes ma'am. With regards to search rankings in iTunes, it's a common myth that ratings or reviews help you get up in the numbers. Whether that was true in the past, I can't say, but I can tell you right now, that's not true. However, if you are a show and you're in iTunes, or any directory for that matter, and someone five stars your show, or someone leaves a helpful review, good or critical, a helpful review. That helps you because you see what your people are thinking. It also shows an engaged audience 
And the next person who comes around who might be interested in that show is going to say, huh, well, other people like this show. Maybe I want to subscribe to it and give it a try. One note about ratings and reviews. You see on Facebook some of these groups, or Google Plus, or wherever, some of these groups that do these review swaps. So somebody will post, hey, I have this show. Here's the link to my show in iTunes. Leave a review for me, and I'll leave a review for you. Leave a link to your show. And they just start swapping reviews. That's not helpful to your show being found in iTunes. And usually, they don't have time to actually listen to your show and leave a critical answer as a review. So it's like, great show, great show, great show. So when somebody else comes around and looks, all they see is these hundreds of reviews that are completely meaningless. They don't help you out at all. And it's a really shady way of doing things. So it, it, it's good to have reviews. It helps you as the producer. It helps other listeners. Just make sure that you're getting genuine reviews from your engaged audience. Don't engage in the review swaps because it's, it's not going to work out well for you. Any other questions? How are we on time? We're, wow, we flew through that. We've got plenty of time. Any general podcasting questions? If I can't answer it, Dave probably can. <laughs> Man, I thought you all had your coffee. <laughs> Go ahead. What's the best? I, I hate to say best microphone. Best microphone, I'd say the hundred dollar price one. What's your use? Uh, just for podcasting. Should are you in a studio? Are you walking around? Are you going mobile? Are you on an iPhone? Nope. What are you on? I'm on Samsung. Okay. Galaxy mm -hmm. The ATR2100 from Audio Technica. Okay. Did you pick up one of my pamphlets yesterday? Yeah, I think I did. It's listed in there on Amazon. It's currently running $79 on Amazon. I'll repeat that Audio Technica ATR2100. Um, it's currently $79 on Amazon. Here's a helpful hint. If you can wait for a sale, do, because they always go on sale and they go on for about 50 bucks. With a Samsung or with an iPhone, you can get the camera adapter. It's usually just a USB adapter that plugs right in to your device. And you can plug that into your ATR2100. And as long as you have a recording app, you're off to the races. Uh, I can tell you Alphonic has a nice Android app that you can record through. And Android being Android, there are lots of recording apps out there. I did a video on the Lipson Tutor YouTube channel a while ago. I think it's Lipson Live 6 or 7, somewhere back in there, where I actually talk about how to do mobile podcasting on an Android device. So you might want to check that out as well. Um, last night, I noticed that the, the what is it, the AT 2005, which is like the 2100, correct? Yeah. It's on sale at Groupon right now for 59 or 57 or something like that. There you go. There you go. So check out Groupon. 58. Might find some deals there. Huh? It's called the AT. If you search Audio Technica Cardioid Dynamic USB XLR mic. That's, that's, that's the black. Like that. That's the black that's version, the black correct? Version, yeah. yeah. It's the, it's otherwise the same mic. It's but just black instead of silver. AT 2005. But they buried that model number. AT2005 USB. Yeah. Yeah. It's on sale for yeah. like the next seven days. Yep. Yep. If you look around, there can be some de deals. Um, man, I've really name dropped him a bunch this weekend. Daniel J. Lewis from the Audacity to Podcast. Uh, he puts out regularly podcasting deals. And if that microphone goes on sale, he will post it every single time. So you can check him out and see if he posts that as well. Daniel J. Lewis, he hosts the Audacity to Podcast. He's one of the good guys. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead.
Are you going mobile? Or are you in a studio? Um, it'll probably be in my room because right okay. now I'm doing a podcast that is professional by other cats. And I want to be in my home. Right, um, right. If you're using a USB mic like the ATR2100 or similar, plug it straight into your computer and you'll use a program uh, like Audacity or GarageBand. Any of those programs will be able to pick up your microphone, record, and then you can go straight into editing and be off to the races. No problem. I think I have a slide. I think I have a picture of it. Okay. This is your downloads by day graph in your general show download set, uh, downloads in Lipson. You notice this trend line? That's a good measure right there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, otherwise, what I tell people is let's say you have a weekly show. Maybe you're releasing it every Sunday night. That's always my example because that's when I release, Sunday night. When I look at my downloads, I'm gonna wait a couple days, if not a week, before I look at my downloads because folks have their podcatching apps set to refresh maybe once a day or every few hours or maybe once a week, whatever they have it set to. So it's only gonna download every so often. It's not gonna download until that app refreshes. So I give myself a solid week before I actually look at the numbers. And I'll make a note. Did I get 150 downloads? Did I get 200 downloads, 300 downloads? Okay, check, I got 300 downloads. And I release the next episode. And I wait a week and I look, and, oh, I got 310 downloads. Now I'm also looking at where those are coming from I account for anything I think really aren't entirely legitimate or from areas I'm not really marketing. I kind of evaluate my own numbers. After you do that after a while, you're gonna to start to see a trend. Well, this week I got 300, this week I got 310, and most of that increase came from iTunes. This week I got 330, most of that increase came from Google Play Music, and you're gonna to start to see that average listenership go up. Does that make some sense? That's a question. I like it. Now, what beer am I drinking tonight? <laughs> uh, we'll talk later. <laughs> Any other questions? How many episodes do you have to have published before you have a large enough sample for these graphs to start making uh, data? Depends on how often you're publishing. Um, you know, I'd say probably at least four or five episodes to start looking at trends. And as you keep going, those trends should continue up. It's gonna flatten at some point and then it'll start to go up again if you're doing your marketing right. Um, but you, you really need at least a few episodes before you're gonna be able to even see a trend. Uh, the other thing is, is if you submit to iTunes and you're one of the lucky ones that ends up in New and Noteworthy, you might see an average listener, not an av average listenership, but downloads per episode be spiked by maybe an extra 100 downloads an episode. Um, really, that's about all you're going to get out of New and Noteworthy is maybe an extra 100 downloads. Notice I said downloads and I corrected myself and did not say listenership because oftentimes, once you're no longer featured, that's gonna drop back off. So if you are featured, you'll probably see an up, and then when you're no longer featured, you're gonna start to see it down. And as new shows, it makes it a lot easier to appear someplace like new and noteworthy. Um, so it's gonna take time, but I would say to look at a trend, don't even start until at least five episodes in. You'll get actual download numbers where you can see where the numbers are coming from, your geographic, all of that stuff with your first episode. Any media file is gonna get those numbers. It's just looking at the trends. Hey Crystal, what, so come on to Lipson and mm -hmm. it, you already have an archive of a ton of shows like some of us do. Like you do. Yeah, 
If you want to make them available, you want to make them available on your RSS feed, they need to be, specific to your question, moving to Lipson, they do need to be hosted with Lipson. And if you email our support team, support at Lipson.com, uh, we can work with you on any rates associated with that. So come see me. Um, typically, the import rate is five cents per megabyte for an import. Uh, however, in most cases, that doesn't get charged. So you just need to contact us and we'll work with you to get that to happen. I think the next people are starting to filter in, so any last question? Going once, going twice. You guys have some great questions. Have a great rest of your day. If you have any questions, stop by and see me or Dave Jackson. He's kind of awesome. Thank you.